All right, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Chuck Miller. I'm the chair of the Cleveland Heights Landmark Commission. And our speaker tonight was my predecessor at the Cleveland Landmarks Commission. Uh, and among some other titles, she was a professor of history at John Carroll University. Um, tonight, we are happy to hear another great historic story of Cleveland Heights from its best known historian. Uh, and she asked me to keep this short, so presenting the case of the disappearing mansions, let's welcome Marion Morton. <laughs> Oh, thank, thank you. Do I have to talk into this? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Can we dim one set of lights without putting everybody to sleep? Folks? Ah, how's that? Excellent. Okay. Well, um, I want to thank the Cleveland Heights Historical Society and the Landmark Commission for inviting me. And I want to thank all of you for coming out on a night which uh, looks very iffy. An hour and a half ago, I said, man, uh, we're, we're toast. We're certainly not gonna, going to uh, have this thing, but the weather cleared up. Hi, Mary. You want to sit over here in this teeny seat? OK. So anyway, thanks for coming out to hear me talk about the case of the disappearing mansions. Um, the question that I heard most often when I described the book, The Overlook, which, by the way, is for sale back there. <laughs> Ken, put your hand up. Okay. When I described this book on The Overlook was this one. Why did they tear down those beautiful mansions? And uh, the beautiful mansion to uh, your left is the H H Herman A. Kelly mansion, and this is the mansion uh, going down in 1969. <laughs> So why did they tear down those beautiful mansions is what everybody asked me. In fact, someone asked me that at Zagaris just the other day when I was checking out. <laughs> uh, and despite the title of the talk, the answer to the question is not much of a mystery. And here is that answer. Those mansions disappeared not because of an evil university, and that is not a pun there in the title. I need a warm-up act, warm act here. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't disappear because of the negligence of Cleveland or Cleveland Heights. Those mansions disappeared because of the American dream that urges all of us to move on and on, forward and upward, to abandon the old and seek out the new. This is the dream that inspired colonists to sail across the Atlantic from, to the New World inspired Americans to move, a move across the continent, stopping here and there to found places like Cleveland. Lewis and Clark did not uh, found Cleveland. And the Sacagawea is that little Indian girl he read about in third grade. This is a dream that inspired city dwellers to move out of cities and into the suburbs like this one. And then out of suburbs like this one and on to the next. Let me first describe how the mansions disappeared. And I want to begin back at the end of the 19th century when two small colleges, Western Reserve College and Case School of Applied Science, moved to what is now University Circle. Western Reserve College, established in 1826 with support from the local congregational church and village leader David Hudson, moved from Hudson to Cleveland in 1882. And that is the Delbert, Maine. You may recognize that building, and it's still there. Uh, burned almost to the ground in 1991. The university has faithfully restored it, and it's more beautiful than ever. And Case School of Applied Science, uh, established in 1880 by Leonard Case, moved from downtown Cleveland in 1885. And that is uh, Case, Maine. You may recognize that. Enticed by a generous gift of half a million dollars from wealthy industrialist Am Amosa Stone and gifts of Euclid Avenue property from others, the two small colleges relocated side by side on Euclid Avenue. Oh, this is very blurry. Uh, but if it were less blurry, you would see, well, let's do this. Let's do this thing. 
uh, a Delbert case made, and here's uh, I wanted to show that. I wanted to show you what small uh, colleges they were. In 1890, or so the story goes, Patrick Calhoun was inspired by the view of or from the Garfield Monument to buy the properties and lay out his Euclid Heights allotment. The premier residential boulevard would be the overlook at the westernmost edge of the allotment lying within the city of Cleveland and what would become in 1901 the suburb of Cleveland Heights. And here is the overlook. Right across, um, right across overlook. The ads for uh, Euclid Heights allotment began to run in July of 1892. They made frequent reference to the beauties of Lakeview Cemetery and to wealthy neighbors like John D. Rockefeller, but interestingly enough, made no mention at all of the two small colleges at the foot of the hill. Apparently, Calhoun did not consider them important or appealing enough to mention. And this is a view of uh, University Circle from the Overlook. It's uh, probably 1914, something like that. With the church spires? I think it's Church of the Covenant. I'm not positive. Yeah, I looked that up, and now I forget what I found out. So Calhoun made no mention of the two small colleges, but seven decades later, the two small colleges got their revenge. <laughs> the story of the first homes on the Overlook and their owners is familiar enough. Several, perhaps all of the owners, had financial or other connections to Calhoun, who may have helped them buy the houses on the Overlook in order to attract other wealthy customers. Examples uh, might be uh, the home on the your left. I get it upside down. Reverse it. Uh, the home on the left, built by architect Alfred Hoyt Granger for himself. Uh, Granger may have intended to build uh, most of the homes in the allotment. He built some, um, but then returned to Chicago. One of the homes he did build was to the other side. <laughs> when, I, when I did this, I forgot. I, you, you would be looking at this way. This is a Granger home. This is a William Lowe Rice home. Uh, Rice was uh, a partner in uh, Euclid Heights Realty. He was a significant investor. And uh, he also uh, was, uh, was a neighbor on the Overlook. Granger also built, uh, designed with Frank Mead um, this home for John Hartness Brown at the corner of Overlook and Edge Hill. Um, it is still there. Um, John Hartness Brown was also an agent for Calhoun's real estate company. Myron T. Herrick, an officer of the Society for Savings, loaned Calhoun $60,000. Uh, and built, uh, which was some money then, uh, and built this lovely home uh, on the Overlook, on the uh, east side of Overlook. I found this in the, um, amidst hundreds of pictures of Herrick and his uh, adventures, particularly in Europe. I found this at Western Reserve Historical Society, and somebody had written on the bottom, I like this one. <laughs> uh, 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 you know what, I like it too. Um, on the west side of the street, Samuel H. Dodge was also an agent for the Euclid Heights Realty, and here was his home. Calhoun accelerated early sales by running a streetcar up Cedar Glen, also accelerating sales in the smaller allotments of Mayfield and Cedar Heights. In 1910, the Overlook was fully built up. And this is uh, looking from Cedar Glen uh, uh, north. It gives you an idea of what the street looked like when it was fully built. 
And thanks in some small part to Euclid Heights and Calhoun, the population of Cleveland Heights rose from about 1,500 in 1901 to s something over 2,000 in 1910. 1910 seems to have been a turning point for the Overlook. The murder of William Lowe Rice, perhaps with the complicity of neighbor and former business partner John Hartness Brown, cast a pall over the allotment. A sensational murder involving two neighbors does not draw buyers, <laughs> usually. In 1910 also, James W. Lee began to develop Carlton Road on the property bought by his father in 1880. You know, I always tell my students, if the phone rings during my class, it better be for me. <laughs> <laughs> and even if it's not, I'm taking the phone. But, but this is different, that's all right. Anyway, James Lee, be ooh, that one's for me, I know that. Uh, James Lee began to develop the property bought by his father in 1886. Obviously, this purchase predates Calhoun's, and either Calhoun didn't want the property or Lee wouldn't sell. At any rate, uh, Carlton Road uh, on the west side of Overlook between the Cuddy and Dodge homes uh, not only cut into the stately boulevard, but introduced into the neighborhood a newer, less formal style of, of suburban home. The homes on Carlton Road would be the wave of the suburban future, as evidenced in Ambler Heights, Euclid Golf, and Shaker Heights allotments. And here's some pictures of those uh, pretty homes. They're gracious, they're lovely, but they are not the huge urban mansions that uh, lined the overlook uh, in its heyday. At least five of these homes were uh, designed by uh, the distinguished firm of Walker and Weeks. In 1911, following an ill-fated streetcar venture in San Francisco, Calhoun returned to Cleveland, hoping to rescue his foundering Euclid's Heights allotment. He could not, barely saving his own enormous mansion, look at that, from the sheriff who came literally knocking at the door. Um, the book has lots of uh, pictures, more pictures of the mansion, and they were donated to Kara Hamley O'Donnell uh, by Patricia Beale, who was a great granddaughter of Calhoun, very nicely donated to the city this and several other wonderful pictures. This was located where um, um, La 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 Cedar Hill Baptist Church is. Yeah, Kraus bought it from Calhoun. After Kraus bought it from Calhoun. The unsold lots in Euclid Heights were sold at sheriff's auctions in 1914 and 1915. Calhoun then left town for good, but he had left his mark on the allotment and on Cleveland Heights. The first generation of Overlook residents began to die or move. In 1926, after Herman Kelly's death, the home was purchased by Ursuline College, which also purchased the Cuddy home next door. And here is a picture of the two homes. Uh, you can hardly see the Kelly on your left, and this is Cuddy home on the right. Howell Hines' widow sold this home on the west side to the west side of Overlook, to the First Church of Christ Scientist Cleveland, which demolished it and built, uh, and here's a wonderful picture of the construction of uh, First Church of Christ Scientist. Um, these photos were, were given to me by Nottingham Spurk, 
I am eternally in their debt for finding them, or saving them, finding them, and, and sharing them um, uh, with me. And in 1929, Western Reserve University made its first incursion into the neighborhood when its president brief, briefly leased this home on Carlton. The Depression and World War II took their toll on the Overlook. In the immediate post-war years, the remaining Overlook first-generation residents continued their exodus elsewhere. And new suburbanites, new people who moved into Cleveland Heights, were not interested in the old mansions. Instead, institutions bought the homes on the east side of Overlook. The Herrick Crowell home became Overlook House, a Christian Science nursing home. The Alexander, then Dangler home became the College Club of Cleveland in 1951. Uh, the Chandler home became the Catherine Horseman home. And in 1952, the cerebral Policy Foundation bought the uh, Granger home that I showed you initially purchased them by the Johnson family, so it's called Granger Johnson here. Meanwhile, the two little colleges at the foot of the hill, Case Institute of Technology and West Reserve University, weathered the economic storm and flourished in the post-war years. Case especially benefited from the war-induced adulation of science and technology and soon aspired to be more than a streetcar college. President T. Keith Glennon undertook a massive expansion of the institution's plants, programs, and personnel. And this is uh, what Case and Western Reserve Universities look like in 1966. If you can locate yourself by the Art Museum Lagoon, Colleges clustered along Euclid Avenue. Case's growing student body, no longer mostly commuter students from the Cleveland area, needed more dormitory space. Expanding east made sense, especially since there were precedents for moving up the hill into this residential neighborhood. Those precedents are, of course, the Western Reserve University Presidential Home on Carlton and then the presence of Ursuline College on Carlton and Overlook. Case bought its first three properties on Carlton Road in 1959. Residential halls on their site would complement the dormitories built below on Murray Hill. A couple of the purchased properties on Carlton apparently became uh, short-term rentals to students or others because in the correspondence, about the purchases, there are complaints from neighbors uh, about the behavior of the renters. In 1962, Case began the demolition of purchased properties and continued to purchase the remaining homes. Most of the homeowners were willing to sell and move. Seven homes were purchased and demolished between 1963 and 1965. And this is uh, Carlton Road uh, looking east toward, uh, toward Overlook. These are the homes that still remained in 1966. Unlike the Overlook homeowners, four or five of the Carlton Road homeowners continued to hold out against the university, which did not acquire their properties until much later. The last holdout, Marjorie Jameson, never did sell to the university, which did not obtain the property until 1999 and then shortly thereafter demolished it. You may remember this property. It's the first property on Overlook as you go uh, move west. Case also began negotiations with Ursuline College, which now owned not only the Kelly and Cuddy homes that I showed you, but the Sherwin home as well. In 1927, Ursuline had purchased property in Pepper Pike. Once it had the funds to relocate, Ursuline sold its properties on Overlook and on Carlton to Case. In 1966, uh -oh. after 40 years on the Overlook, Ursuline College moved to its current home. 
And this is a nice, uh, must have been a Christmas card or something that uh, the archivist at Ursuline found for me. Case then began uh, with the demolition of the uh, homes that it had purchased on Overlook and completed those demolitions in 1969. And this, I showed you at the beginning, this is Kelly home. Um, CWRU did not apparently save any photos of that demolition, uh, but Ursuline College did. So uh, this is a photo from uh, Ursuline, not from CWRU. Or if CWU had the photos, they, um, they were not sharing them with me. Um, the over owners of Overlook followed suit. And here's Overlook House uh, coming down in 1969. Uh, and when uh, the Christians, uh, when Overlook House came down, uh, the owners also demolished the H.H. H. Johnson House, which was just to the north um, of, uh, of the uh, Herrick home. And this was the home of the architect Philip Johnson, uh, as you may know. Uh, and also demolished in, was the Russ Norton home in 1972, which the Overlook House had used for uh, nurses' quarters. And so these Overlook and Carlton mansions were disappeared. The how of the disappearing mansions is clear enough, but that leaves the initial question, why? Why raise these elegant homes? As I suggested initially, this is not actually much of a mystery. So let's line up the suspects again. First, the now Case Western Reserve University. The university had sound practical reasons for uh, demolition. Although Ursuline was at first able to use the old mansions for their small student body of 200 young women, even Ursuline outgrew the old homes. Case did not, in any, um, in any case, think that these homes were appropriate for the large numbers of male students that administrators hoped to attract. The university needed large dormitories and fraternity homes, not elegant single-family homes. And frankly, if you've ever seen what college students do to a home, I think you will agree the demolition was far more respectful of the homes than letting students live there. Second suspect, the cities of Cleveland and Cleveland Heights. Even ha had they wanted to, there was little that either city could do about the demolition of private property by its owner, then or now. Owners chose then and now to buy and sell their property and demolish it if they so desired. All they needed was a demolition permit. The new dormitories did require rezoning of the single family district. But Murray Hill had already been rezoned for dorms, and there were already two apartment buildings on Overlook, providing a precedent for multifamily housing. Neighbors did protest the rezoning, especially neighbors from Chestnut Hills, who feared that the university would approach them next, which it did. Because as you know, the CWRU president's home uh, is on Harcourt Drive. Both cities completed the necessary rezoning in 1966. Third, so it's not the university and it's not the cities. And here's the real culprit, third. That restless American spirit that urges us on to greener pastures and newer and better homes, especially, especially as that spirit played itself out in the 1960s. As you know, Clevelandite's population peaked in 1960 and has declined ever since. That decline has several causes, but one of them is that its population simply moved elsewhere. This movement was made easier in this decade by new federal highways that connected downtown Cleveland with suburbs farther east, south, and west. And that's where folks began to move. 
that restless American spirit in action. Today, we might call that urban sprawl. Back in the 60s, we called it pursuing the American dream. And in the name of that dream, other grand homes on Overlook and elsewhere in Cleveland Heights, the Severance Mansions, for example, or the Briggs Estate, had already fallen to the wrecking ball as their original owners moved elsewhere. On the Overlook, the Eels residence, uh, the Eels residence were, were demolished for an apartment house uh, which is uh, still there at the corner of um, Overlook and Euclid Heights Boulevard. Very nice looking building and the um, um, original wall for the Eos Mansion uh, remains. The Rice home was demolished for uh, Waldorf Towers. Uh, and uh, next door, uh, just to the north of Waldorf Towers, or the William Rice home, was the Palmer House, which uh, had been demolished already uh, in, the early 19, uh, in the early 1940s. There was no significant historic preservation movement in the 1960s, and preservation is a tough sell, even today, when it's economic and other benefits are more widely recognized. Demolition, not preservation, was the trend in the 1960s. The best example of that is the uh, policy and practice of urban renewal, as practiced by both the federal and local governments. Urban renewal is a policy equivalent of that American desire to move on from the old in search of the new. It provided public dollars for the removal of, quote, blighted sites and their replacement by new structures. Urban renewal was at the height of its short-lived popularity in the 1960s. The city of, Cle of Cleveland, in fact, launched the most ambitious urban renewal projects in the country. And this um, slide gives you an idea of the size of those urban renewal projects. I don't know whether you remember those or not. Uh, and this dark shape, funny shape one is actually University of Euclid Urban Renewal Project. Uh, there was some talk initially of including Carlton Road in the University of Euclid Urban Renewal Project, but I do not think uh, that happened. Uh, this is a, a remnant of uh, that urban renewal policy and practice in Cleveland. This is Erie View Plaza. Not incidentally, most of the cost of Case's new dormitories and fraternity houses was financed by loans from the federal government. These loans were not intended to rehabilitate old buildings as they might be today, but to demolish the old and build new. And in fact, in 1953, Cleveland Heights had already begun some urban renewal of its own, tearing down some apartments at Kenilworth and overlook for a parking lot and small playgrounds, which are there now, if you're familiar with the neighborhood. This demolition was described by Cleveland Heights officials as, quote, blight prevention. So it is no wonder that a decade later, case administrators described the university's demolition of the old mansions as halting, quote, the deterioration of the Carlton Overlook neighborhood. Although it is tempting to get nostalgic about the old disappeared mansions, the Overlook and Carlton, now uh, mostly south residential campus of CWRU, look pretty nice. Well, at least I think they do. Uh, three of the original homes on uh, the Overlook are still there. This uh, one, and if you're uh, an habitue of this neighborhood, you recognize them. This one, uh-oh, this one. Uh, Alexander Dangor Home, now the College Club of Cleveland, looking uh, better than ever. Right, Jill? Yep. Uh, and this one, the John Hartness Brown House, which you recognize uh, as well. Two of the Carlton Road homes remain. Uh, this one, uh, which is a fraternity house now, and 
Whoop. This one, uh, which is uh, uh, faculty housing at this point. The university has built dormitories and fraternity houses. Well, I think those are nice. Uh, tennis courts and uh, some interesting public art right on the, near the courts there. And a small public park as well. And of course the adaptation of the first Church of Christ scientist by the Nottingham Spurk, uh oh, Nottingham Spurk <clears throat> sustains and perhaps even enhances the beauty of the old neighborhood. If there is a moral to the story, and why shouldn't there be, I guess it would be this do not heed the siren call of suburbia, move on, move on. Instead, Stay here and enjoy and appreciate what we have in Cleveland Heights before it disappears. I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but sometimes even the choir has to hear the sermon one more time. So thanks for listening. Lights. Oh, lights. Do you have lights back there? Chuck, not lights somewhere? We're in the darkness here. Ah, good, good. Um, I'm happy to entertain any, uh, any uh, easy questions that you may have at, the, at this point. Uh, yes? You said the Granger Johnson House. There are two Johnson, that's what's confusing, yeah. It was just, um, well, let's see, you know where the, well, it's now McGregor Home. You know, the Christian Science Nursing, Nursing Home Overlook was just purchased by a, a McGregor. So that home was just to the north of that house. When, when Overlook, when the Christian Science Foundation bought the uh, Herrick House, they bought also the Johnson House. And they took them both down at the same time. Yeah, I showed one. No, no, the inside of the house. Oh, the ins did I see the inside of the house? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I had a very hard time finding pictures of that house. Um, I finally found one through an old high school classmate. Never underestimate your old high school classmates. <laughs> she, she had one, but I had dickens of a time finding a home. Yeah. Yes, according to Philip Johnson's biography, that's correct. And I could have lifted the picture out of there, but I was afraid I'd go to jail. So I, because that, that, of course, that's not legal to do that. For the book, I could have done it for this talk, because, you know, who would, who would know? But if I would put it in the book, I would have been in big trouble. So I got the same picture from someone else. Um, yeah, Kitty? Uh, one of the things that you didn't mention, and the only reason I know is that I was living here, during the Second World War, when there was a housing shortage, yes. a lot of the old houses became multiple families. Yep. Right. And Cleveland Heights was really worried about that. They didn't want them divided up. They didn't want multiple people living, you know, not related living there. Right. And actually, the people in the neighborhood of the Briggs house right. went door to door getting signatures in order to tear that right. down and build the beautiful condo. Right, right. I just, there were something like, there were very many people living in the Briggs estate. Um, the um, Rice home became a boarding house briefly uh, and some of the other homes in that neighborhood as well. They let it go during the war. Right. Everybody knows it was someplace. But immediately afterwards, they started going Right. Well, it's a good, you know, that's a good question. What do you do with these big places when uh, individual families don't want, to own, uh, don't want to maintain them, don't want to own them? And the question was what to, what to do with them. And the city, I think, did the best it could. 
by rezoning for residential use along there, so allowing apartments, but maintaining the residential quality of the, of the street. And I make this point in the book, too. You know, Cal when he planned the, the, the overlook, Calhoun had uh, Euclid Avenue in mind. And the overlook never became uh, what Euclid Avenue became, and that's because of the zoning that was established early. So I think we did pretty good. Uh, I think it looks nice. I like it. Yep. Economics, um, to maintain a house, any one of those houses, you had to have a staff. Oh, yeah. And obviously things change. You, where do you find people to mm -hmm. your maids and your servants and your butlers and so on? So it was impossible to maintain that right. house, even a case or a reserve in one. Right. It was some, yeah, very difficult. The taxes the, the owners felt were too high. Uh, no, I, I don't blame them for walking away. I, I, don't, I don't, hope I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody or anything. But, you know, they had every right to move, and they did. So, uh, Jill, go ahead. Who put up Walmart Towers, and in what year did that happen? I think it was 1960, and I forgot who the, you mean who the builder was? I, I forget. Oh, Fred White. Fred White's family bought it from Rice, and she sold it to someone else, and that person sold I forget exactly the, who sold for Waldorf. Oh. Sorry. Although it would be easy enough to find out. I just don't know. On um, the county property records would have that information, probably. Yep. Is it pretty much like that's on all the floors, like the I'm sorry? Did they like take down all the trees? No. No, I don't think so. I think it's probably more wooded now than it was. If you look at the, um, dare I do this? Uh, look, at the, uh, look at the trees now. So, so it, it still remains, at least to me, a very beautiful spot. It's not what it was in 1910, but then what is? When they first built the mansions, did they take down the trees? No. Well, the story was, and I don't know whether this is true or not, Chuck, you may have heard it as well, that the um, Calhoun bought it from uh, uh, Dr. Worthy Streeter, who had denuded it of trees already. So Calhoun actually planted trees. Well, that's, that's the story, anyway. I don't know whether that's true. It should be. It's not our fault if it isn't. Oh, I've forgotten that. Yeah, so, so Euclid Heights was only between Coventry and Superior where it dead ends. Okay, and then Euclid Boulevard was from the top of Cedar Hill up to Coventry. Did, do you have any idea, this is a two-part question actually, do you have any idea when they formally decided that they would just call the whole stretch Euclid Heights Boulevard? No. No? Okay. And do you know also at um, where Edgehill comes in, uh, at one time it was called Heights Circle which was the original turnaround for, for the uh, streetcar system. They didn't actually originally all go down Coventry and Maple and everything. But you stopped there by where St. Albans is. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, okay. In fact, even when I moved here in uh, the uh, early 60s, the CTS, Cleveland Transit System timetable for Euclid, the Euclid Heights line would list Heights Circle I didn't know that. as one of their points. As one of their staff. I didn't know that. Um, oh, that's interesting. That's not to say that the tracks didn't continue out, but they were interurban tracks uh, from that point out. Um, the, the Euclid Heights streetcar then ran west on, or north on Coventry and up Mayfield. Yeah, north on Coventry and right. then later right on Mayfield. Right. And ultimately was extended uh, to uh, Lee Road. Right. And that was it. And that was it. And then they all came down in 1949. Yes. Yes. Kenilworth did extend through originally. Good eye. Uh, I forgot. 
Yeah, that's where the muse are now. Is it muse is or muse are? <laughs> I said, that's where Herrick muse homes are. Yeah, right, the carriage houses are. Now, Kenilworth originally went through. Yeah, and in the book, I think I mentioned the date when that, when that became Herrick muse, but I don't remember it without looking it up. So that it was so. Yes. And then how no, the carriage homes were always across the road. Always across the road. Yeah, and I, I'm, I've always assumed that the street was vacated, I see. Uh, so that those owners whose homes were on Overlook had easier access, or so that Myron Herrick could get to his garden more easily. And the remnants of those gardens are still there, and uh, pieces of them. Those gardens were so big they appear on Sanborn maps, along with houses. I mean, they're huge gardens. Were huge gardens. They're gone now. Ken? I think it says in the 27th flat book, vacated. So what, is, that a, is there a date? Yeah. So what do, does he have a date for that? Oh, 1927. I got you. Okay, 1927. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Why did Kenilworth have to be rebuilt? Was there a reason for that? Over on the other side of Cedar? Yeah, on Chestnut. That was a Bicknell house. Did they keep the front of that and add on to the back or not? Uh, yeah, I think so. I've always assumed that. It's been a long time since so I've been in that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's, that was the Warren Bicknell house over there. Yes? Um, I worked for Terra Herman Gibbons once. They, it's a different company now, but um, they were the ones that built the very back edition on that. On on uh, Judson, yeah, Judson. Oh, okay. Uh, you know where where uh, I guess it's on the West Street. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah, it's like this gigantic tower. Yeah. Yeah, they did that. Um, as far as I know, the house was uh, the house that it was attached to had a big renovation and uh, restoration when that was done. Okay. Probably. From the outside, it looks very similar, except there is an addition to the on uh, south, I think. The house was made into um, apartments. Apartments now. Right. Well, the, I remember there was a servant's wing, and the servant's wing was completely, I think it was either demolished or completely done. And the bedrooms stayed kind of as bedrooms, as Sort of grand bedrooms, and uh, and then that edition on the back is actually the second edition. It was a previous one. Okay, thank you. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, I'm having trouble figuring out where Carlton Road was or is. Yes, yeah, it's still there. Turn left at the tennis courts. That's right. Yeah. I'd like to share with the group an anecdote about my house. I live at the corner of Norfolk and Berkshire in a house that was built in 1919 by a man named Sylvester Fleshheim who had founded Master Builders, which today I think is an international company. We've been in that house for about 47 years. And one summer, shortly after we had moved in, there's a knock at the front door, and I went to it. There's an elderly lady standing there with a big black Cadillac at the curb. And she said, do you live here? Yes, I do. May I come in? Well, yes, why? Well, I grew up in this house. My father built it. So she came in for a few minutes and walked around, and she said, may I come back tomorrow with my sister? Mm. And she did, and the two, I, I left them alone, and they wandered through the house. And our home has the French doors off the dining room leading to a patio, which then goes down into the formal garden hall, which had been put in when the house was built. And she said, my sister, I, one of the girls said, I got married back there at oh. the oh, cool. And we had members of the Cleveland Orchestra playing. Oh, my goodness. Way. So 
I said, well, we remodeled the kitchen. She said, well, we never went in there. That was a place. <laughs> 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 wow. Assuming Olga was there cooking. Okay, I, don't know. But I think every one of the big old houses in Cleveland Heights could tell a story. Mm -hmm. And if the original occupants could come back and share with us their experiences. No, we enjoyed that. They stayed for a few minutes. And they told the stories about what it was like to live in that very nice old house. Well, we do have wonderful houses here, among other things, that are wonderful about our city. Anything else? Oh, yes. Do I know anything about the golf course at Warrensville? Are you asking me about the Oakwood Club? Do I know anything about its past or about its future? Because I, if I, past I know something about, but future, no, I don't. Have any. Past, it was, Oakwood was, Oakwood, I think, was the Jewish response to the fact they couldn't get into Yucca Golf Club, or the Yucca Club. And so they built, Oakwood, and I think they bought, they bought the property very early, 1903 or 1905, and this was be their golf club. Uh, as I said, a response to the fact that they could not easily get into Euclid, the Euclid Club down here. Future, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. Uh, Barbara? It was right down Derbyshire, right, right down Derbyshire from um, what it, where Cedar Hill is now. If if you yeah, if you read you could got the Yoko Golf book by Deanna and Hugh, yeah. Um, yes. Right. And uh, tried to stop and succeeded in stopping right. the development of that site. Right. I think the developers then were... Right. I, yeah, I, yeah, I remember that. Uh, and then um, Walmart built anyway <laughs> where the Severance home was. Yeah, right. Right. I remember that. Cleveland Heights said it's best. Uh huh? Yep. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. And I, you, there's some. Uh, you have your questions.